Well, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, of course, I was very excited to meet the organizing team. Just amazing work. I, I, I don't know how they do it every year at the level of professional, professional behavior and overall kind of engagement with the entire community as they do here. So I just really want to thank them for everything they're doing for this entire community, a worldwide community that is growing really rapidly, as you can see from that room and elsewhere. The other thing I wanted to thank you for is this the first talk in a month that I don't have to talk about James Webb. <laughs> which is... I like James Webb, but I'm still glad I don't have to talk about it today. And uh, you know what I wanted to say as I launch into it is uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is really how we think about NASA science from the context of small spacecraft. And so you should ask questions that are transcending that scope of, of uh, presentation. I can't possibly fit everything in. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave some uh, time at the end. You may want to start the clock just to be sure that at the end I know when to stop. So, so I really uh, appreciate uh, uh, being able uh, to do that. So what I'm going to do is really focus on three topics. And the three topics are in the context of small satellites and CubeSats enabling new science, how we think about small satellites and CubeSats in the context of innovation, and how we think about mission success. So what I wanted to do here is actually, there's many ways of doing that, but what I'm going to do is kind of organize my talk around five new stories. Some of them, you may have seen a little bit of it. Some of them, I guarantee, are entirely new. But all of them relate to that initiative that we're engaged in at NASA Science, which relates to the very topic at, uh, at your heart, which is uh, small satellites. Of course, uh, NASA Science, uh, as you know, relates to a bunch of disciplines. Those are the disciplinary buckets uh, you have solar system, also known as planetary sciences, heliophysics, that's the space between the planets, uh, all the way down to the atmosphere where the Earth science starts, and then astrophysics, which is, you know, about very simple questions that are actually really hard to answer, like where did we come from, things like that. The Joint Agency Satellite Division relates to our cross-agency partners, NOAA, and uh, the spacecraft that we built for them. These spacecraft, of course, in Earth science and uh, heliophysics, as well as uh, the Joint Agency Partnership satellites, have tremendous impact. So they're not only focused on what we know about nature, but they affect our lives in a direct fashion. As I was fl flying in last night and I flew over smoke, I could not uh, forget the amazing capability that we have now on two spacecraft that actually allow us uh, from our ghost satellites to actually detect these fires at the level of accuracy we've never been able to. That's the kind of stuff we do. Some of these satellites that we're working on, and there's 107 of those if you count at them, uh, are mentioned here. You see in each one of those disciplines, there's quite a number of them. In both phase are the ones that we're under development with, and all the others are already in flight. You see there's a lot at the Earth, I think if you counted them, there's 17 in flight and uh, quite a number in development. You see uh, there's a couple there at the moon. I'm going to talk about this uh, more. And then you see on the planetary side there at the bottom right, uh, you know, missions around Mars. Uh, inside, I'm going to talk about in the context of Marco, of course. Uh, but then also uh, other planets uh, all the way out there are the Voyager spacecraft that were built uh, when I was a kid. And uh, basically, I still have the book in my office. If you ever visit me, I'll show it to you. It's the first book I ever got about space. And it's talked about Voyager uh, being built in the future. Soon, they will build Voy Voyager, it said, and the orbits, the unique orbits that enabled them. The reason I'm telling you that story is we intend to make history here. What we're trying to do is push the envelope wherever we can, and especially there in heliophysics around the sun, there are missions that are big, but there's also missions and quite a number of strategic missions that are actually multi-point measurements. And so, so also there we intend to make history. And uh, basically, I'm going to talk about those and then astrophysics over there. So that's the chart we always show. 
It's kind of a little bit of a Bragg chart. Let me tell you, show you the Bragg chart that we made for this conference. Those are the small sat and CubeSat missions that are currently on development and are, on, are in flight. So what you see is, first of all, most of them are either around the Earth or the Sun. So they're kind of in Earth science and heliophysics. Now, I'm sure you don't remember, but if you did, two years ago I stood here and gave a talk about the National Academy study that I was honored to chair, and it said the most important science that could be done with CubeSats the most number of opportunities, that is, would be in earth science and heliophysics. You see, that's materializing. Even in those few years, it's materializing, and you see a lot of bold-faced, which means they're under development, and the ratio of bold-faced and, and uh, not bold-faced is, is really high in favor of the bold-faced, which means the slope is really increasing of number of uh, missions that are uh, going there. You see a number of missions by the moon, and uh, some of these missions have an asterisk because they're actually, of course, related to science, but not all of them are funded directly out of, of the science mission directorate. There's other uh, directorates that are in, invest in this, and we think that's a good thing. It's a really good thing that, that we do that as we go forward. I think some of these things uh, will evolve. It's a rapidly evolving, evolving uh, system. So we're coming to the first announcement, which, for those of you are policy Wonks, uh, this is all news because it's actually part of the budget that uh, the last upland change was approved 10 days ago, but it's the 2018 budget, and that is that we made, that's the first initiative I uh, put in place when I joined two years ago, we added $100 million or so per year of investments in small sat cube sets across all of science. I felt, because of that academy study, it was absolutely critical that we're doing this, and we're doing that in, in all around. And I'm going to show you some of these things that, were, that are totally new opportunities and, uh, and were, um, were, uh, coming, uh, are coming out recently or will come out in the near future or even today. We manage technology and innovation by leveraging partnerships and commercial efforts across disciplines. We believe that the right way for NASA to do small sat and cube sets is not to ignore the commercial sector and try to compete with them, but quite the opposite, hitch our wagon to it. Because we believe that the right sustainable and the right kind of uh, environment, the right community is built if we work on this together. And of course, the type of sensors that we're interested in are unique sometimes. Sometimes they're not, because somebody can find a business case uh, out, outside elsewhere. Of course, we want to inno invest in innovative early stage research and technology to promote uh, economic growth in that sector and also uh, uh, beyond within uh, NASA and beyond. So what I'm going to do now is focus on some of the science news that is out there that's focused entirely on small spacecraft. And I'm going to do so focusing on three science theme that all of our investments are about. The first one is to discover the secrets of the universe. We look at nature and we ask questions that we don't know yet how to answer. Scientific research is all about pushing back that boundary of ignorance and if elucidating things that, and connections in nature that we've never understood. It's these secrets of the universe that are worth understanding. That's what we're about. One of those secrets, by the way, relates to search for life elsewhere. It's one of those topics that has been with us for millennia. For the first time in history, however, we can address that question, these very simple questions, with the tools of science in a way that has a real chance of making progress. I don't know when we know the answer and what the answer is, but it's not about a yes-no question. It's about interrogating nature at the interface of the physical chemical world to the biological world, an interface we know very little about at this moment in time. And it is to protect and improve life on Earth. Just like all the other key themes, this theme is interdisciplinary in nature. Of course, it relates to our science, but as I mentioned before, it also relates to the fact that we're a technological society and therefore are dependent on space weather in a direct fashion. And we want to be sure that we learn how to predict uh, space weather that is, um, could hurt our uh, infrastructure and uh, protect uh, the United States and society worldwide. 
So those are the three themes that we're using with every one of the missions that we're doing. And those are the themes that I'm also going to use as we're discussing uh, the science with small satellites. You've seen this picture, and I think it's amazing. Because it's a picture of the Sun-Earth system taken from uh, the first interplanetary CubeSats, one of the Marcos. And of course, uh, this one is Marco B, Marco A. I don't know whether Andy Clash is here. I don't think so. Oh, there you are. Happy birthday. Yeah. Yesterday, right? <laughs> All right. Today? Oh, God. I'm going to not sing, but uh, <laughs> I, wish, I wish I could, but I like people too much. All right. So, so I think that's amazing, um, you know, what, what they're doing there. By the way, it's super hard. Just because a spacecraft is small doesn't make it easy. Uh, I think a highly constrained spacecraft kind of pushes the engineering and pushes the ingenuity of the team in a way that, in every way, is comparable to some of these big missions that we're doing. And so, so this one is uh, no exception. What I really love about this, and you know, you could come up here and fill the hour, but what I really love about this is that uh, so far, you know, these missions uh, are doing really well, and of course, we want them ready when we're landing on Mars, uh, it just so happens that where we're landing is actually turned away from the Earth because we want to land in a specific region and things rotate some way and it just happens to be at the back side. And for us to have an eye on this entry, descent and landing, we need a turnpipe communication system and we believe that one or both of them will be available for that. We're really optimistic about this because of the fact that some of this turnpipe character has already been tested and we also know that uh, the Marco A already did uh, uh, the uh, overall trajectory um, maneuvers, uh, ch changing the trajectory by 9.2 meters per second delta V. That's really cool. So I'm really excited about this because it's really at the interface, really at, at what we have been able to do and where we're going next. So really breaking new ground. I love this picture about Luna Map. This is one of those things that I showed over there uh, at the, over the moon. And of course, this is at Arizona State. And it's Nathaniel, Terry, and Savannah. Are you here? They're probably at work. <laughs> anyway, so, so I love this picture because it signifies, of course, the tremendous innovation this mission is about, which is, of course, there to detect hydrogen in these shaded craters at the polar regions of the moon. But what it's also about is training the next generation. It's really putting a team together that actually can do amazing work like this, uh, work that uh, is a lot harder than it looks. It's learning the humility of touching hardware. It's learning that even though you could be having a degree from some of the best universities in the world, at the end, the question is, does it work or does it not work? It's not what the name is with the diploma at the wall. That's really humbling. And it's great to learn that early. Because those people who have that experience can transform the industry. Those who never have that experience, they're going to shout from the roofs with very little impact. So, so for me, that's what I really want to talk about here. I want to talk about one that's uh, in heliophysics, and it has to do with the Minx, uh, you know, uh, instrument that, of course, is shown here together, here on the right, is shown here together with SDO imagery uh, from the sun. And, of course, what you see is the pre-flare. This is just how the sun emits uh, high-energy radiation in the X-ray. And then you see how the flares, uh, you saw the, the, the curve riding up and down, how uh, the, the flares are changing that emission. That's the very space weather I talked to you about earlier with tremendous impact, in, uh, especially at high fluxes, uh, to our technological uh, society and our assets out there. It's amazing that that's possible to do this in a small package like this. And I'm really excited that this, of course, had a one-year very successful mission duration and that the University of Colorado, in this case, is working on the next uh, versions of this because, if possible, this really can change the paradigm how we do this type of monitoring. There's some really new um, observations that uh, you've seen in the last few months or so, in this case uh, by IceCube. Of course, uh, IceCube was funded by NASA for a spaceflight demonstration of a commercial 
883 gigahertz cloud radiometer. And what is, is shown here is the result of that tech demo. And it's basically really showing um, the uh, radiances kind of in that uh, equatorial band, uh, really showing uh, the three months average of ice clouds with brightest peak areas representing the largest areas of ice clouds as well as locations of heavy rain and so forth. And, and so for me, could you make a better image with a very fancy spacecraft? Yes, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is, can you get valid, really suitable type of and good uh, measurements with this at appropriate resolution? The answer is yes. And so for me, that's what's uh, really exciting about um, IceCube, uh, you know, a mission uh, that is currently uh, out there. First cube is looking at astrophysics. You remember, of course, back to the picture that I showed you earlier, there's not a lot of astrophysics going on yet. That's actually not too big a surprise because many astrophysics topics relate to the size of the bucket. You know, so six and a half meter across, two and a half meter across. Well, and perhaps some of you figure out how to fly spacecraft so accurately that we can compose those things with flying bodies, but until then, that's probably not the right problem to fly a CubeSat for. However, uh, there's others, and it has to do, of course, with um, multi-messenger astrophysics. Uh, you, of course, see at the bottom LIGO, and I remember uh, the story, it's kind of, a, I call it the home run of multi-messenger astrophysics when LIGO observed, of course, that chirping signal, uh, which uh, was interpreted as uh, merging neutron stars. And what happened is a Fermi, a Fermi, by the way, it's a very, a, quite a, uh, aged mission that's out there and its publication rates are going through the roof because of the fact that they provide the very data that is needed here, which is the gamma, the gamma ray bursts that are coming from the very same object. So it's a very unique event that will go into history of uh, astrophysics uh, because of the fact that for the first time we saw that uh, neutron star merger together with its uh, uh, gamma ray counterparts which is precisely what Burst Cube is going to address. So, so it's really uh, those kind of um, uh, investments that we're making. So is everything we're doing going to be small set? No. What we want is a balanced mission portfolio in which, and there is Web, see, I couldn't stop, but, but that we're at some part of our uh, portfolio are missions that are really, really super hard and we're trying to do, whether that's landing on Mars, whether it's that mission we're going to launch end of this week, the Parker Solar Probe, that will make history because of its tremendous uh, orbit and its new measurements near the Sun, these flagship missions for us are a national priority and provide civilization-scale science. What I mean with that is not only changing what we know about the subject, but they have the promise to change how we think about ourselves. Remember the question about finding life elsewhere? That's one of those questions. You know, I always talk about Hubble as an example there. I would argue I did that experiment on multiple continents. Close your eyes, think of the word galaxy or space. What do you see? Somebody says a Star Trek theme. No, that's not it. What do you see? You see a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope. That's what it means to do this kind of work. We have, of course, large missions that are high priority. We try to drive the risk down. There. They're actually PI class missions in many cases. This is the Juno a mission there. And then we go all the way down and we want to go to class C and class D missions where we go from medium uh, priority into really uh, a set of missions that is focused on higher risk with limited budgets. By the way, if we only do the flagships and not do that, two things happen. First of all, we have all eggs in one basket. And God help us if something happens with that basket. The other thing is, we have leadership today, but not leadership tomorrow. Because the amazing manager and investigator that's working on this flagship mission is going to do that. But who's the next person who's stepping up? That's why we really need to go look at the other Class Cs and Class D type of missions and really drive that. So we don't want just all flagships. We also don't just want small. We want a balanced portfolio, and that's what we seek to do. 
And we seek to do that in part because we understand or we believe we understand how innovation really works. And, and what I'm going to show here is kind of a simplified view. And of course, you could go to any business school and they give you a nicer view and with less spacecraft on it. But, uh, but basically, it's a chart that talks about the kind of technology innovative potential at the bottom and the programmatic impact. Uh, technology at the bottom or market size is another way you have seen this, uh, seen this chart. And it basically shows that these regions in which innovation happens are regions that are really different and have different kind of DNA. And what I'm really going to want to focus on is disruptive innovation, which is at the top left there, which is actually not a tremendous enhancement in technology. Actually, in many ways, disruptive innovation is about making things worse, not better. But by doing so, enabling a capability that otherwise is not achievable. So incremental uh, innovation, we often think of that as not so important, but I just want to submit to you test, the test mission that's out there and just started science operation. Basically, most of the technologies, if not all of the technologies, were basically known. But they were improved tremendously through these steps in a way that makes it a really compelling mission targeted towards a science objective, which is to find the nearest uh, exoplanets uh, from, from us, make it really target a very, very successful mission. Of course, the breakthrough innovations, I could have put James Webb down there, uh, because basically what it is, it's really super technology with very few targeted applications. The, some of these technologies that are developed there are not are not going to be used for everything we're doing. That's the difference between that and game, cha uh, game changers, which are, for example, like deep space lasers, could change everything. And so I know many of you are working on this, and rightly so, because if it's working, this really changes how we get shuffle data back and forth between the ground and space and space and space. And of course, some of you work in companies that are working on constellations are focusing on that just now. Disruptive innovation is the one that I think we need to put in front of our minds, and it's something that actually has been written about a lot in various business books and otherwise, and it's actually really hard to do, and it's really hard to do, especially within NASA. That's why it's so important to us, by the way, as a site comment, that we don't do it in isolation, because this is easier to do in a startup. It's easier to do, in many ways, in academia than it is to do it within NASA. That doesn't mean that NASA shouldn't get engaged in some of these things, but the point is it's hard. And what it's hard is basically the following conflict. So suppose you're the principal investigator who just won this mission, and he basically said, look, I want to build this spacecraft, and I'm going to build this commercial bus which flew three times. And I want to build it, you know, to print. So the poor, you know, quality assurance person who yesterday worked on Europa Clipper or some other billion dollar mission is basically saying, wait, built to print, are you kidding me? How is this going to work? Like, show me the documentation of this and that and the other thing. And the PI is really struggling because, frankly, there is no two, you know, feet of documentation on some of this work. Well, enough needs to happen. In every case, we want to do good engineering. It, we, don't, we don't endorse sloppy engineering, no matter what the risk stance is. But the point is, the documentation and the engagement needs to adjust if we do this. Disruptive innovation, as I mentioned, is an innovation that is not there because everything becomes better. It's because through the innovation, something happens that is otherwise not achievable constellations, for example, and also some measurements uh, of which we've already talked about. So enabling innovation, as an example, we could talk about this mission, which is really a mission that is disruptive in a sense that there is a source instrument that was out there and, and for many years provided information about the radiation of the sun. And uh, what's really uh, exciting about this is there's a single 6U CubeSat with about 10% of the mass and, uh, you know, the technological breakthrough that's mentioned here, that basically has the promise of continuing that series with this. 
Now, if that really works, that's amazing. Again, I mentioned before with the, with the x-ray example, it changes how we do that monitoring. But it's not there because it wants to beat source by a factor of 10. It's there because it wants to be good enough to continue that measurement. Otherwise, you have no chance. That's what disruptive innovation is about, to find the angle. And I think for me, Cygnus is really a great example. It's a, a mission of eight spacecraft that's out there. And, uh, and you know, I mean, there's, there's a hard mission to do. Uh, a mission that's, of course, looking at the reflection of GPS signals of water, whether that water is in the ocean or whether it's in Australia, as we see here. And basically, what is shown here is results of this, uh, the measurement of soil moisture in the top five centimeters or so of the soil as a function of time. And it's that kind of measurement that can be done at high time resolution uh, with eight spacecraft. And frankly, you can't do it with a single spacecraft. If you want to do this with a much more fanciful spacecraft, you either go to GEO and build a big, uh, you know, um, radar, which, you know, takes a lot of, lot of energy, probably not possible, or you go to LEO and you have repeat times that are a factor of 10 less uh, order of magnitude than this, this constellation. This is what disruptive innovation is about. And trust me, it's not easy. It's a learning experience for everybody. I happen to be next door or kind of down the building from Chris Ruff, who's the PI. I don't know what Chris is here. But, uh, you know, I've seen him work this and work with some of you, I met some companies this morning, work with parts that these companies develop and really try to put it together into a small package that does what it's supposed to do. Uh, one of the things in my job that I get is every so often, every morning I get everything that's wrong in the entire mission suite, I get an email from it. So I saw sickness quite a number of times because, you know, these spacecraft didn't know which way to look. And, you know, and you have to learn how to run these things autonom autonomously and, and learn how to do this. Of course, that's exactly what we expect. So we, it would be a huge mistake if a guy like me or somebody reporting to me got all nervous about this. This is what it takes to learn how to build new mission uh, constellations, new mission designs. And so uh, I'm going to go uh, to this one, which I think, frankly, is a small miracle. And that's RainCube uh, that's out there. Uh, the first ever uh, CubeSat-based uh, kind of radar that's out there and, and really is a, a technology demonstration. Eva Peral is the, is the PI at the JPL. And uh, what I wanted to just show you is, remember my five announcements, uh, the, the second one of my announcement, and that's what I would call first light data. It's not science grade fully yet. You know, so we have discussions about policy. We're at small sets, so we're good calling that first light because guess what? It's photons, and it's the first ones that are detected really as a bounce. In this case, not fully nadir, but uh, uh, as a bounce from, uh, from the radar. I just really want to congratulate that team. Just like every other uh, spacecraft, by the way, every instrument I've ever built, every spacecraft I've ever built, uh, when it launched, you know, cost a lot of nerves the first few weeks because you have to figure out what you actually built and learn how to run it. Uh, all the software mistakes you find there. So, so I'm sure they're working the same type of issues. They may not be here because they're really uh, working this. But I just want to uh, really tell you, we saw this uh, first bounce and are really excited about this. That by itself is a major uh, breakthrough. I just want to congratulate that team. There's some right behind them, Halo set, the uh, examining X-ray, uh, hot gas surrounding the Milky Way galaxy, and uh, and you know like also there moving forward, it's right, uh, it's right uh, going forward. So how do we manage uh, this uh, type of um, this type of uh, payload, this type of spacecraft? Now I've worked for 21 or so years at the university. And, you know, I, I remember how hard it is, was sometimes for me to understand the various cultures. Many of you were, are at the same kind of interface as you look at uh, the various processes, of course, that grew because of really, really good reasons. People learned how to build reliable systems. But what's really important to us as we go forward and, and, and look, at, look at 
these small satellites and the CubeSats, we want to be sure that we don't suffocate inadvertently the very value that they provide to us by suffocating them in process. Process that's highly appropriate for billion dollar missions, but I think needs to be adopt, adapted and adjusted in this case. So, so what we did, and we have actually put that out there, we're communicating, and one of the reasons I talk about this, by the way, is that I want feedback. In a sense, it's not working, because I have no illusion that this will work. I told at lunch uh, to somebody, you know, if anybody thinks that we can change a culture by putting out a process and signing it, they don't understand humans, you know? Culture moves at the speed of trust. And so what that requires is an, in, in a discussion that keeps going on. So what did we do? Uh, we're cutting down the number of reviews. I actually only uh, see uh, one review, personally. Uh, normally, all spacecraft come to me. Everything, every one of the key decision points, five of them come to me. Uh, I only see one of them. Uh, key decision point C. That's, by the way, the one where we really lock in the cost. It's also the one where we decide not to go forward. And my personal, see, I know people too. My personal feeling is the only way you can be a division director in our organization is if you fall in love with your missions. The only way you can cancel a mission if you have a loser is somebody like me canceling it. So that's why I make the decision. Uh, that's why the decision comes to me, because you should blame me, not my team. So, so, so that's the only reason I'm there. By the way, I have no intention of ever canceling a mission, but I want to be in the loop if I have to. Uh, we also are changing how we staff these reviews. Uh, we're actually adopting the Cadillac rule, so it has to fit in a big car, the, the, the reviews. Otherwise, it's, it's like I don't want reviews in which, uh, in which the, reviews are, the reviewers are three times more people than the team that's working. And so, so the, other thing, uh, the other thing we did is we actually changed the documentation in a sense that there's not multiple parallel documents that basically are there. Of course, you need to understand your requirements. Of course, you need to understand how you build a system. Otherwise, you're not engineers. I mean, you, I mean to me, really uh, understanding how these things relate to each other, that's what we teach in all the grade schools. That's how great companies work. Write down how these requirements work, how they break down, but don't write it down 20 times using a format that uh, we give. Um, the, uh, how we uh, deal with uh, the tech approach uh, is, is in a way that uh, performance measurements I should talk about first is, is we actually, you know, we have for many of these missions, we have earned value management type of systems. Uh, we're not doing it here. Uh, up to a certain price of $100 million. So we have certain principles that, of course, we want. Like, you need to understand what the tasks are you'd want to do uh, and need to be able to assess whether you're making progress with your task as fast as you're spending money or not. That's good business practice, but I don't need you to uh, get certified for earned value management. That's not uh, the right way. And use the tech approach that's suitable and basically explain that to us uh, the right way. It is. So, so basically, for me, that's what we're trying to do. Again, the reason I'm talking about it is I solicit feedback. We're not done with this. This is the beginning of a journey. We've put it together. But the only way you can help us get better is by letting us know. Uh, you can find me uh, easily. You can find my team. Uh, Jim is there. Many of uh, my team are here. Talk to them if there's something that is not working the way it should. And by the way, I would not be surprised if you have examples right now. All right, I'm coming to my next announcement. And uh, again, uh, some of you are uh, uh, really truly um, connected to the news and uh, social media may have known that we actually have a small satellite constellation data by. And we're announcing today, of course, that we have selected three companies uh, to go forward with that, which is Planet, Digital Globe, and Spire. What we're doing with this is tell, uh, follow up with what I just said earlier as a value. If you have data that is of value to the science community, you've expanded the value that for, comes from latency and so forth, and you want a secondary uh, market out there, we're in the business. We would like to understand how we can do that. This is a learning experience too, trust me. We're going back and forth with procurement and otherwise to learn how to do this, but uh, this is the first three. Thanks for the, your patience. Thanks for sticking with it. Yes, thanks. The only thing I'm going to tell you, this is not the last thing we're doing, the last time we're doing this. Like, you have something we should know about that provides amazing data we'd like to know. 
And so that's really is one of those uh, s signals that I hope we are we're sending about how we want to interact in that, in that realm, in the realm of small spacecraft and uh, CubeSats. Of course, uh, launching is really critical. It's such an exciting time about launch. There's so much innovation. I mean, I walked around, looked, uh, talked to some of the um, venture class launch vehicles, talked about some of the others. Uh, I heard Kiko is here. I don't know where you are. But anyway, uh, some of my you know, uh, friends, people I've known for many years working in various companies, really looking at um, how we launch. Uh, and of course, we have the, uh, the overall, uh, we have the initiative that is run uh, by uh, our human exploration uh, uh, run uh, launch services programs. And, and frankly, they have launched uh, 100 and uh, they have uh, selected 155 CubeSat missions for launch, and you know many different organizations close so zoning in on 100. So I'm really excited uh, for this. But what I've asked myself is, whenever I look at the payloads that are that we're launching, kind of our on the first mission charts, you know, Go 17, Inside, Grace, Follow On, or Tess, I always wonder, you know, what what if you could right or wrong uh, with these? Some of our missions that have true science value, some of them, um, you know, with uh, international partnerships or uh, new kind of innovative measurement techniques that could catalyze how we do things. And I wanted to tell you is an initiative we're uh, putting in place right now and announced today is that we uh, really want to invest in that increasing launch market that's out there by really starting a new uh, rideshare policy. Every time we're buying a launch vehicle uh, in NASA science, we're going to go with it by we buy an ESPA, an ESPA ring that is already book kept. So we're not going to ask whether we need it. We're going to try to figure out, you have to convince us that we don't need it. And of course, the initially, what we're going to focus on is some of the payloads that we may have ourselves already invested in. But what we're really interested in is partnering really in that two-sided market that's so complicated, right? With launch opportunities and the, uh, the, the payloads out there, really trying to create opportunities that really, for us, opens the door because we want to start investing in some of these new uh, launch vehicles that are coming out there and we want payloads to be developed. And for us to do that is by adjusting a policy that really can be a gap filler where there's such a thing uh, that is needed. It's also a commitment to really that small sat cube size, size uh, scale that is uh, out there and is so critical for us as we go forward. So we really are focusing a lot on uh, understanding. Of course, I uh, don't know where Jeff Faust is, but I, everything I know about this conference, I know from Jeff's Twitter stream, you know, <laughs> on any other conference, by the way, but, uh, but, uh, and others. But, uh, but I, uh, we're spending quite a lot of energy and, uh, and with a great team really focusing on how we coordinate uh, this. I remember at the beginning of innovation, uh, kind of a transformation like the one I think we're in the middle of. Frankly, efficiency is not the most important metric success is. So the fact that there's a number of people kind of duplicating each other's efforts, I don't care. At the beginning, go race. You know, the question is, can we get there? As we start turning and we go forward, we want to understand how we coordinate what we're doing, for example, inside of NASA. We want to uh, also learn from each other. So in other words, if somebody learns something uh, with a specific application in heliophysics, we want to learn about that application across all of science, across all of NASA investments. That's what good organizations do. That's really what that is, both focused on, on uh, learning from each other, but also on strategy and policy, how we do this. Like, how do we select uh, CubeSats to make sure we have best practices so we don't inadvertently uh, kind of see risk where there is none or not see risk where, there, where we should uh, because some things may not be uh, right. So, so uh, really we want to engage commercial uh, new space industry partner on uh, science and technology and we have and utilize small, the Small Spacecraft uh, Systems Virtual Institute. It's something we started uh, over there at Ames and I think our colleagues there have done a really good job but there's a lot of effort that we're putting in it to grow that going forward. I want to talk about one element that I actually think is a source 
of uh, where, where we really need innovation, I would say, and that is how we uh, interact internationally. What this is, is a number of initiatives across science and their international collaborations with uh, NASA and uh, international partners, such as in missions, they're all covered up, they were green, except Canada you see there still. And then agreements and globe and, you know, sport with Brazil, all kinds of agreements. The point is, however, for hardware collaborations, for big missions, the model that we've the models we've developed for collaborations really aren't that applicable for small spacecraft. Uh, as you know, if you've ever worked internationally, it's really hard to get each other, to get to know each other. It's really hard to actually be in sync and move forward, and it helps if you work with each other for a decade in round numbers. Well, in small spacecraft, that's not the right time scale in many ways. And so basically the question really is, how do we do that? And of course, we're committed to doing that. There's a number of uh, collaborations that are already happening. But the point is, we need to think more about this as we go forward. And especially as our strategic missions are becoming multi-point missions that are much more based on smaller platforms. And we want to be sure that we don't lose that very important value of international collaborations that we've learned over the last many decades. We believe that there's no difference between, there's no, that leadership and partnership are not opposing values. We can help each other, we can lead through partnership, and that's what we'd like to do. And it's something I just wanted to flag at this moment in time. It's something we're spending time on. Think about it as you go uh, forward. So, finally, what I wanted to talk about is the new program opportunities. Remember the 100 million bucks, they should show up somewhere, right? And so, so they're showing up in a bunch of new opportunities. Earth science, by the way, has really built out uh, this. And frankly, what Earth science did in many ways is, uh, in, uh, actually many of the processes that Earth science has used, we're adopting across all of science, just because they're good processes, I would say, first of all. Like the multi-tiers, you know, where does the technology development go? Where does where do the, you know, kind of the tech demos go and so forth. But uh, what's also interesting about Earth Science is that um, many of the competitive missions, venture class instruments and venture class missions are turning out to be small satellites. So what's happening here is that as far as science is concerned, the small platforms that many of you have worked on for years have graduated. They're out there and they're doing amazing work and can compete head to head with missions that are very different in, in paradigm. Uh, we're announcing uh, today that, um, actually we're releasing today, a call in heliophysics. I think that you worked on, right? Uh, really exciting. I did a lot of work on a technology demonstration mission of opportunity. And you should know that, I mean, that's coming out right now. You saw a draft in the past. But uh, this is investing up to $65 million in uh, ESPA class payloads and so forth. This is payloads that can actually take a ride out uh, to, uh, to L1 or, or can take a ride around uh, the, our exciting heliophysics uh, environment. This is really a novel type of application because of the fact that it deliberately focuses on enhancing the technological capabilities in that area as a key and primary uh, criterion of uh, selection. If successful, of course, this will not only teach us new science, but it will protect our technological infrastructure that is sensitive to space weather, both on Earth and near Earth. So we're really excited about this. You see, of course, that we're uh, making investments in planetary sciences um, in, uh, with the uh, with, uh, program, the Simplex program, and then also in astrophysics, in which a, kind of a, a vehicle is being used to really make um, small sat missions available through a competitive process. So the point you should get, we're in business for small satellites and uh, CubeSats, and I think the proof points that you have here is our only indications of things that are happening right now, both success in space, but also programmatic and policy uh, progress towards creating a better in sync, a better matched 
um, uh, kind of community across the board. And the person at the center of all of it is, of course, Charles Norton, who uh, you know for many years has been one of the leaders in this community. And, uh, you know, I have to say, I met him when I was uh, working on this academy uh, study that I reported two years ago. And I uh, really, I think we were in Korea, he and I, and some, and some uh, uh, waiting for a plane somewhere. And I asked him, you know, Charles, it would be really amazing if you came and helped us. And the good news is he said yes. And so, so I'm really excited that uh, Charles is there. Send him emails, connect with him. You know, if you see something that we're not seeing, here's his email at the bottom. The only important thing is his middle initial is D. So I want to see how many emails you get in the next five minutes. <laughs> but uh, what he's actually also doing is really chairing that small uh, spacecraft coordination group that really is designed to do the very thing I said earlier, which is to really align the pieces within headquarters. I want to stop on this slide. And it's a slide that was actually a picture that was on the uh, front page of our calendar this year, a calendar I really love because it has a science image every single day. This was a, a calendar that's out there and recognizes that this is an anniversary year. Explorer 1 was launched end of January 60 years ago. And you see uh, that the program that we have relates to that. Explorer 1 is the first science-focused small set. And it's right in the middle of that eagle that indicates the pride that we have working in the program that we're there. From this, of course, there's a number of spacecraft, but you could not imagine ISAT-2 that we're going to launch later, the Parker Solar Probe that we're hopefully launching later this week, and, uh, and uh, many of the other missions, if it wasn't, for the tremendous uh, insights that came from Explorer 1. Uh, we launched earlier this year Explorer 98. And I would argue that as we're closing in on 100 and exceeding Explorer 100, uh, we're going to come back and realize the importance of small satellites, not just uh, as, a, as a platform, because as an enabler to do science that is otherwise not reachable, because what we think in science, small sats are big. Thank you so much. All right, so uh, we've got about 15 minutes or so for questions. Uh, we've got a couple microphones here that, uh, so here's what's happening. Of course, we've got all the people in here. We're also streaming to the rest of the venue, and then we are streaming this online. In order for the folks online to be able to hear this, they need to hear your questions uh, asked at the microphone. So uh, if you have a question, please step forward to one of our microphones, and we've got about 15 minutes. Not all at once. All right, so I'll, I'll ask one while we'll, we'll people get up. Um, we were talking about earlier about uh, maybe some small satellite missions to explore the moon, something like that. Do you have any thoughts on something that we could do like that? So our 19 budget, which is currently up on the hill and being marked up, has a line for lunar exploration in science. It's a unique thing. It's a line in lunar exploration for science that actually is very different in its character. It's actually a, um, a proposal to use commercial entities to go to the surface of the moon and basically not for us to build landers, but actually use their technology that they already built. And if you want, you know, buy services from them. So for us, uh, our expectation is that we're going to start flying those uh, 19 or 20, uh, 19, you know, uh, in a year or two, and basically start uh, putting payloads uh, to the surface of the moon. As we're going there and flying uh, towards uh, the moon, there's opportunity through other uh, programs uh, uh, to actually drop off things in orbit. Right? And so, so for me, uh, the focus right now in science is to really make that commercial lunar uh, program work and uh, see what, whether, how, much, how successful that will be. But, but uh, we, we should see quite a number in the next two, three years, quite a number of opportunities to uh, go to the moon, go into orbit around it, but also go to the surface with some of the payloads that many of you are working on. 
Hi, I wanted to ask about uh, space traffic management. There's been a lot of talk in commercial space about how important this is going to be. How do you see NASA and the uh, initiatives in small sets and cube sets figuring into that potential problem of space traffic management? Thank you. Yeah, so it is a potential problem, and uh, as you saw, that you know, if there's an important policy discussion going on right now with at least two stakeholders trying to why for, uh, in the US, that is, for important uh, uh, influence. I think it's a really critical element and we're connected directly uh, with the discussion that's going on. That's, uh, that's all I'm, I can say right now, just because I think uh, there's, there's a lot, I mean, the issues are kind of obvious uh, that need to be addressed. And, uh, and uh, the question really is what the policy framework is in which we're doing it. And I think that's the discussion that's ongoing right now. But we are connected in a direct fashion, as you know, our administrator, uh, has uh, been very vocal about our interest and uh, the importance for us to be involved in that discussion, and we are. Thomas, one of the harder problems engineering-wise is space-based interferometry. Have you had any discussions on optical interferometry using small sats for some science gains? So, yeah, so I, I mean, I've, I've seen uh, discussions like that pop up uh, at a variety of levels, and, and, and there are, in fact, some experiments that have um, that have been proposed. Um, are there some in development already? Sunrise, Sunrise being one of them. I, I mean, like um, the hard part for me is I know the 107 missions all by name down to two questions, and I'm only one question deep in many of the others. So I need to fix that till the next time I speak. Uh, that, that's the condition I tell everybody. I need to be two questions deep. So I think, you know, um, I really do believe that, that as we go forward, and especially as we think about it in the context of um, astrophysics, which is where some of these uh, interferometry work is happening, is that, uh, you know, this is one of those paradigm-shifting uh, capabilities that, depending on how accurately it can be done, can really dramatically improve some of the remote sensing capabilities, whether that's uh, of the sun or, or the cosmic ray background, in this case, uh, that is being proposed. So, yes, it's coming up, but I would argue it's, you know, it's one of those things that it's going through its S-curve, right? We're seeing the beginning of it. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your support, Doctor. I appreciate it. Uh, I speak for a small, the very small technology company. Uh, we've worked with the military before, and the strategy has been to work with primes and subprimes. What do you recommend for small uh, companies like myself that want to get on that disruptive uh, innovation path? What opportunities, who, I mean, what's the strategy, what's the pathway to get involved in some of these uh, initiatives? Do we go through primes and subprimes like is the strategy with military? Or does NASA have set up some way to interact directly with some of these small to very small high-tech companies that may have some of this disruptive technology that you're looking for? Thank you. So, thank you. Thanks for the question. This is when it matters that I only spoke about science and, you know, like there's other activities going on, of course, in, in the tech side of the, of the house where, where those kind of, uh, you know, Opportunities are exactly targeted at the question uh, that you have. I remember that Charles Norton email. Send that guy an email and he can connect you uh, with it. But, but look, I mean, there's, there's opportunities that are going on there, precisely targeted to the question that you have. Um, on, on the science side, you know, at this moment in time, you know, there's at, at, at the science side, you know, we're really focusing on, uh, you know, really, by the way, without these investments uh, by... Uh, our tech side of NASA, as well as other agencies and, and investors also in the private sector, we would have nothing, right? I mean, kind of for me, I recognize that we're, we're building on, on that uh, tremendous value, and it's important for us to, to recognize that we want to continue to make sure we bring an entrance into the market, especially as they have new and exciting technologies. What we're doing on our side, though, is very often competition-based and PI-driven, and actually it's really interesting. We had discussions this morning with a number of companies that brought up that very point. They basically said, where is the right engagement point with, uh, with uh, principal, potential principal investigators or, or organizations that want to propose? It's something we're taking with us. I think it's a perfectly good question over and above the, the recognition that, you know, the uh, science mission, second? SBIRs, of course, as well, yeah. But, but as you said, that's what you're running out of the 
uh, tech side of, uh, of NASA. But over and above that, it's something that we want to think about and kind of see whether there's some kind of open door we can create that may not be as obvious. Rob Staley at JPL. First of all, thank you for a very refreshing statement of SMD position going forward on small sets. A lot of us have been in this business for a while, and it's great to get the recognition. One of the areas where um, I have some question and think there might be a way the agency could work a little bit better in this arena is in prior SMD calls, there have been situations where we think a particular science investigation and set of instrumentation um, can satisfy goals of both SMD and HEOMD. And we're often discouraged sometimes by prior reviews of our proposals from going even a little beyond what the language of that specific proposal said. And I'm wondering if it's possible in future solicitations to allow, I, I don't know how to put it, but maybe extra credit. Yes, you have to answer the mail the specific solicitation, but it seems to us like it would be more valuable to the agency and in some cases give us a competitive advantage to have the value of a mission concept to more than one directorate or more than one discipline actually be counted towards selection as opposed to becoming a, a, de a detriment? That, uh, so first, thanks for your patience, uh, for people to catch up uh, with you, and thanks for your leadership. And uh, I think actually that's going to get a lot easier. Kind of in many ways what we're doing, especially when it comes to the Lunar campaign, we actually have a deputy in the front office of the Science Mission Directorate whose job it is to find those opportunities and make sure that we adjust our processes and systems to make sure we benefit from them so the integration can be seamless. So, so I personally feel that in the absence of that, it's goodwill, right? We have to really have examples. Steve Clark, uh, you may or may not know him. He used to be the Heliophysics Division Director, again. You know Charles Norton, of course, but he yes. can connect you with him. But, but I think it will be perfectly, it will be, he's always the answer now, yeah. But, <laughs> but it will, I think it will be a perfectly good uh, way, kind of on the anecdote level, to say, is, look, like, this is what happened. This is the kind of stuff where we can have benefits that uh, disappear if we are looking at things kind of from only one perspective as opposed to from multiple perspectives. Uh, across the overall uh, science disciplines, um, I think that's a discussion we're also having. Again, uh, that's why that's why we're for us. That's that's one of the thoughts behind the coordination is to really the coordination group is to to bring to the surface those kind of opportunities, because if we're just looking at them in the silos uh, of a given uh, discipline, I mean it's it's good to organize there because the discipline is organized that way. You know the scientists are organized that way, but we have to look kind of the value across. Uh, it also, for example, value relative to the technology breakthroughs that can occur. So, so we're putting the systems in place. You need to tell me, uh, as, per, as some time passes, whether they're working. But uh, we recognize the issues and we're working on them. Thank you for the inspiring talk. Um, I really like the discussion about uh, your um, you know, strategy to implement uh, small set missions. Um, so I think people who are trying to do small set work, you know, they all acknowledge the importance of like cutting down reviews and documentation and taking more risk. But uh, at least to me, you know, it seems like the reviewers and Temco are not on the same page. You know, it's um, oftentimes the proposal gets ding, you know, for uh, maybe cutting reviews or um, you know taking more risks. Do you have any strategy or, or any plan to get them on the same page? Yeah, thanks for that question. You know, what the job is of TEMCO, you know, the independent review organization that we run proposals through, is to identify risks. And I want to know what the risks are. Now, they need to learn how to identify that. The way to do that is actually to have in their reviews experts from this community. And we have implemented that. Uh, you know, if we, we're, we're having these very discussions. What's also important to recognize that the risk friendliness or kind of how many risks we accept is not Tempo's, Temco's job. I mean, kind of, sometimes I feel bad now, so I, I know these people in Temco, some of them are actually amazing innovators. We blame them for not taking risk. Well, it's not their job to take risks, it's our job, right? So, so, so if you 
depending on who the selection official is, in many cases it's uh, at the division director level or uh, at deputy level, sometimes it's me, depending on how big the mission is, you should ask us, you know, how many risks should we accept? And in some cases, some of the risks are, you know, kind of uncertainty relates to a risk. So in other words, hey, we don't know yet where we're launching. Is that a risk? I don't, I mean, risk is the wrong word for that, right? Of course there's gonna be launches, but you can't figure out which one right now. And so it's these kind of things we're trying to really identify and change. So I, I just talked to you about this one, where it went and changed that. So that's actually communicated to us outside of a risk classification. And I'm sorry to say, but we first had to learn that by failing, right? So, so in this case, I was not uh, part of it. It was, you know, for whatever reason, I was not, right? Uh, but I was like, wow, that, that feels wrong, right? It, it's just like we cannot ask people or encourage people to do kind of be part of ride shares and then ding them for the very thing. So anyway, so, so we're fixing... Uh, these kind of things, creating communications from these processes, but I just wanted to uh, point out uh, that uh, not all responsibility is the Temco teams. It's really also the question how many risks we're taking uh, kind of as we're going uh, forward this, this, and you know, I mean, you should analyze some of the missions we've selected and make your own judgment. Uh, 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 just on behalf of LASP, and I want to say the same thing, Dr. Dan Baker senses best, and we're doing some great. We're so proud, our whole team, of seeing Source and, and T CSIM and TSIM up there. And, and we just want to ask uh, from the Inspire program and from what we're doing in space, well, how can academia work more closely with what you're doing to make sure that we're on that same track and that we can be all areas of that, uh, that great path that you have set out for us? Wow. I thought I should ask you that question. <laughs> I'm actually not quite sure what the question is you're asking. And for me, you're actually, in many ways, the University of Colorado, because of its size of investments in space, is really, for many universities, is kind of uh, an example to look at, as is Utah State Universities, you know, some of the, uh, it, some of the uh, universities there. And I'm not quite sure what you're asking. I mean, we're, we're you know, in academia, we get 85% of all proposals, if not more, we get from the academic community and it's, uh, you know, the commercial community outside of NASA. And, and kind of the vast majority of the things we're doing right now are there. Perhaps your question is, is focused on operational missions where it's going into the joint agency, a realm in which kind of another agency gets involved. And, and for that, you should know we're, we're having those very discussions with NOAA. And, and, you know, they're thinking the same type of thoughts, you know, they have different kind of uh, constraints, different value systems in some ways, you know, kind of, we're not into operational modes on our, on our side. I mean, that's not what we do for a living at NASA. We're trying to break that boundary of ignorance, right? But, but uh, um, you know, there, I don't have a strong, I don't have a simple answer. It's a wishy-washy answer because we're still working on it. But on the, others, on the other side, I think the, uh, on the NASA proper side, you know, I, I wonder what, whether I'm missing part of your question. You know, I mean, I think uh, the academic community overall has responded really well, and, and I'm really excited for uh, this, uh, you know, the academic community being involved. Frankly, what I'm focusing on is, you know, like in our discussions, is how do we make sure that that community remains strong, uh, not just one or two universities, but kind of enough uh, diversity of universities because what we need is a really a diverse workforce that is really bringing us forward both in NASA but the community as a whole as we go forward so we're really depending on that and say hi to Dan Baker too. Hi, thank you for uh, taking my question. Um, I work for a very young startup uh, developing a novel propulsion, tech propulsion technology and this idea of ride sharing is very, very exciting. It's a wonderful opportunity to take de phantom, replace demanifested missions and make uh, opportunities more available to all sides of the spectra, academia and private. Um, my question is, how do you see the evolution of that system accommodating the needs of both private and academic institutions? So, so this is one of the, thanks for the question, it's, you know, so we're aligned with the overall value 
that you're outlining, namely that we want new technologies to fly, kind of the inventory of technologies that are available to us to increase, and especially new uh, observations of space some of you are working with, to, uh, you know, whether it's Earth or other type of observations to, uh, to be available to us. We want to do our right chair in a way that pushes that forward without undercutting the industry that's growing behind uh, us, right? Kind of the, the venture class launch vehicles. We in, in no way uh, want to, I mean, frankly, oh, I wish I could buy them right now and go, right? We have some things that are getting ready uh, to, uh, to launch. So for us, uh, what's really important to us as we go forward and finalize this policy and move forward is to, to, to strike the right balance. So we do the right thing with the right type of opportunity. So, so um, the details of your specific technology, if, uh, you know, I can't answer at this moment in time because I don't know your technology, but also uh, as we go forward, uh, also, uh, is, is, I, I would argue, is going to be an ongoing discussion to make sure that we're really growing uh, the industry, really growing the capability and become kind of a, if you want, a first buyer, you know, of the services that are out there that, we're really, uh, that we really look forward to. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Thomas Zerbuchen.